Hello, I'm Marisa Escobar, and I welcome you to the session on Water Beyond Boundaries, Stories from Colombia and Southeast Asia. We are a group of people from this initiative, from our centers and offices in Nairobi, Bangkok, Bogota, Stockholm, Seattle, Boston, and California, working on water issues around the world. We work with institutions, water utilities, academics, civil society, and communities, identifying inclusive water adaptation solutions. In our practice, we have made progress in making water more equitable, and we have promoted water climate resilience. However, as you see in the headlines of the last few months and years all over the world, water is central to climate resilience. From the news about the drought in California to water scarcity in Asia, water challenges continue to be there and are only getting more complex to tackle. Water has always been central to development and now it is central for a sustainable future. So despite the many efforts on water, the effects of climate change require us to accelerate our efforts. But where do we start? How do we focus our efforts? Where will we get the most return on investment? And what kind of science can guide this effort? The SDGs and the 2030 Agenda help us focus. Here is a list of the main water goals from drinking water to cooperation and participation. From this global assessment, it is clear that there are a few components that are lacking behind. In particular, we see that the last four goals on water that comes in and out of the watershed, water for ecosystems, and the cooperation and participation angles of water are key entry points for resilient water. Of course, water stress and sanitation also stand out, but we know that finance and other mechanisms are going into those areas. The reality is that water is interconnected with the rest of the world through trade, aid, and climate. And because of this, transboundary issues go past water transfers and go beyond the watershed. We argue that tackling these four goals, we will be able to support the achievement of key global water goals and other sustainability objectives. So by focusing on how water is connected to the outer world through trade, aid, and climate, but focusing on our rich and diverse freshwater ecosystems, and by increasing participation, in particular, gender representation in water, we can pinpoint key gaps and unlock key areas of concentrated action to keep working for water access and water justice. Water that comes in and out of, water, of the watershed through climate aid and products needs to be taken into account in water balances. And it impacts, it impacts freshwater ecosystems requiring the continuous monitoring of habitat. This also requires cooperation away from what happens within the confines of the basin, which calls for innovative methods for data sharing and co-production of water plants. More schematically, when we work on water planning and management, there's a defined spatial and time scale of focus. At those scales, institutions plants and ecosystems are delimited by the watershed. But those people and institutions need to connect to communities and its cultural gender dynamics. And global agendas. Those ecosystems operate at daily patterns and need to be sustainable for decades to come. And the planning that happens at that scale sometimes misses local agreements and can hardly integrate the decisions that are made beyond the boundary of the watershed. So based on these, key areas of focus are water teleconnections, early ecosystem consideration in water planning, and inclusive, multi-interest, multi-scale participatory approaches. And this is why, to address these areas, we need to look at the science behind these key issues and to water beyond boundaries. So through our initiative, and using our strategic location, we are working in two specific case studies with incredible people in the coffee region of Colombia and in a rice production region of the Mekong, where communities and ecosystems are continuously struggling to keep their water while connecting to the world with their products. In this session, we will hear the stories about how we are trying new ways to highlight these key areas and to produce data and information to quantify water balances 
habitat requirements, and co-production processes to reach agreements around water that can benefit all and that contribute to the rapid adaptation that needs to happen now. Let's continue with the session and let's hear some stories. Thank you. Thank you, Marisa, for, for introducing us to the Water Beyond Boundaries initiative. As you have seen, we have a poll um, in the pathable um, close to the chat. Um, and basically, we're, what we would like to hear from you is which aspect of the Water Beyond Boundaries are you most interested in? So in our presentation, Marisa mentioned three topics, um, teleconnections, how do we consider processes occurring outside of watershed, participation, how can we be inclusive in decision-making and ecosystems, how can we consider local species in planning? So um, as of now, I can see that our audience today um, has ranked teleconnections followed by participation and ecosystems. Um, let us leave um, a couple of seconds more and see if, if this is our preferred choice today. Let's see. Just, um, just a reminder, we're going to explore each of these topics during our case studies presentations. So, okay, a slight shift towards participation. <laughs> Let's see. Doug, you tell me when, and I think we're we're good with the time. Right, and I can I'll take this time to uh, for the questions and answers. Um, well, we have some time after we watch uh, some videos on the case studies to address questions and answers. So uh, put your questions in the pathable chat, and then we can try to address them then. Yes, thank you, Doug, for for the reminder. So save your questions and type them in the chat if you have them. I will be able to address them later. So, okay. So I think I think we have the results here. Um, Fifty percent participation, twenty-eight percent teleconnections, twenty-two percent ecosystems. Great. Thank you very much uh, for for voting. This is only for us to get a sense of what our audience is interested in. And now let's uh, kick off with our case study presentations, starting with the water narratives from Colombia. Everybody see the screen? Yes. All right. Hi everyone and welcome to our session. We're very happy to have you here with us. I am Claudia Colioni, a research associate at the Stockholm Environment Institute Latin America Center. And today I would like to share with you the case of the Campo Alegre River Basin located within the Magdalena Calca Macro Basin in Colombia. The waters of the Magdalena have long shaped the life and the collective thoughts in Colombia from multiple perspectives, be it through the environment, society, culture, the economy, home to more than 35 million Colombians, over 70% of the country's population. The Magdalena Calca Macro Basin spans over 272,000 square kilometers, covering nearly one quarter of Colombia's national territory. Economically, it is the country's principal riverine trade artery and the main connection to the Atlantic Ocean. And now we are about to zoom in to present some of those water narratives at a smaller scale. Located within the larger context of the Magdalena Calca Macro Basin, the Campo Alegre River Basin has a total population of over 100,000 and a total area of nearly 64,000 hectares, with 78.7% .7 located in the department of Risaralda and 21.3% in the department of Caldas. Many productive activities in the Campo Alegre River Basin rely on the intensive use of water, which may limit water availability and cause water use conflicts. Here we highlight some of those water-mediated activities, such as 
coffee, which gained traction in the 70s with the technification, hydropower generation, such as the development of small hydropower plants, mining, such as alluvial gold mining, which also represents greater risk of water pollution, and tourism, due to what is known as the coffee cultural landscape. Now let us explore the water tower connections taking place in the Campo Alegre River Basin using the coffee sector as an example. Coffee plantation corresponds to 24% of Campo Alegre's area. It can also be considered a water-intensive activity. Each kilogram of dry parchment coffee requires 40 liters of water. In 2019, the Campo Alegre produced 15,000 tons of coffee, both through traditional and organic production. But where does the coffee go? Does it stay within the boundaries of the Campo Alegre River Basin? Well, if we look at the department of Risaralda, where most of the Campo Alegre area is located, out of the 47,000 tons of coffee produced in 2016, only 5.3% was consumed in Colombia. The remainder was consumed internationally, with the United States as the main destination with 40.9% of the exports. As we can see, Coffee production is a multi-scale activity. It may be taking place at the Campo Alegre scale, but the effects go beyond to other scales, such as the Magdalena Macro Basin or even internationally. This is what we call teleconnections. In other words, these unseen long-distance interactions generate water-related dependencies beyond river basin boundaries, yet they are not explicitly considered in water management decisions. To further explore those interactions, we have developed the Watershed Topology Tool, WAT, currently implemented as a working prototype through Excel Macro and based on SCI's WIP model, which is the Water Evaluation Planning, applied to hydrological modeling. When we look at the key components of the Campo Alegre WIP model, we may perform topological operations such as accumulation to analyze the interaction, for instance, of the coffee production processes at multiple scales. Through the river network, the water sources, and their interaction with the water users, we may calculate the cumulative effects of coffee production and verify the scale and the water resources required to sustain this activity. Now let us explore more about ecosystems. Ecosystem considerations should be a vital component of water management processes. The assessment of ecosystems and their relationship with river flow conditions is of great importance to determine how they will behave in the face of human interventions and thus be able to establish design parameters from the early stages of the projects. Around 18 different species of fish can be found along the Campo Alegre River, such as the Ciprinus carpio, which functions as an important indicator since their presence in the area being a non-native species reflects the changes that the ecosystems have undergone due to human activities. Among the aquatic species that inhabit the river are the benthic macroinvertebrates, which represent the greatest variation in diversity and are recognized as the best bioindicators of water quality. This is because within these insect families, there are genera and species that are tolerant to pollution and lack of oxygen. This allows us to draw correlations between water quality, for instance, through this Campo Alegre map, and the presence or absence of certain macroinvertebrates. To model the effects of various management options on the availability of habitat and the viability of aquatic species, we have developed the Aquatic Habitat Assessment plugin for WIP. This is our typical workflow. We start with a water management scenario in WIP, from which we can obtain this stream flow. From there, we apply hydraulics to see the flow depth velocity relationships. We can choose, for instance, the velocity and apply suitability curve for a certain fish species. The result estimation of key habitat metrics characterizes the ability of the river habitat to support the important biological functions of aquatic species like fish. Now let us explore more about participation. 
The main planning instrument for Campo Alegre is the River Basin Management and Development Plan. The PONCA formulation process starts with the prospective design, which leads to the construction and analysis of trending and ideal scenarios. This is when stakeholders will define the future scenarios, asking questions such as what will the economy look like in 10 years' time? To help answer this question and to allow for a more interactive participation, we have applied serious gaming for water planning in the Campo Alegre River Basin. These figures illustrate how this process works. Participants start with current sustainability scores when no additional action is taken. Based on their selected package of strategies, they will obtain new sustainability scores, allowing them to compare performance indicators across different scenarios. Those answers will result in the environmental zoning, which defines where certain activities can take place in the river basin. Now let us look at participation from a water user's perspective. For instance, a social group composed of coffee producers. If the coffee producers want to be more involved in the POCA formulation, they'll have to select a person to represent them. The coffee sector representative will then become a member of the River Basin Council. The representative would have a consultative role with the council, and from there, the environmental authorities will make the decisions based on the collective agreements. Transitioning from one participation instance to another does not necessarily mean high quality participation. From the social group to its elected representative, we could ask, does the representative report back to his or her group? If so, is there any feedback? Is it properly incorporated? We can also look to the transition between the consultative to the deliberative body and ask, do the environmental authorities represent the collective interest of the council? In other words, it is vital to make sure that the needs and opinions of the stakeholders are incorporated in the decision-making process. As we have seen, all components, teleconnections, ecosystem consideration and participation are essential for multi-scale water management. I would like to quote the Colombian writer Gabriel Garcia Marquez, who said in his book Love in the Time of Cholera that he realized that Magdalena, father of waters, one of the great rivers of the world, was only an illusion of memory. If we consider those components in an integrated, beyond the boundaries manner, we may witness not an illusion, but the full sustainability potential of the Campo Alegre and the Magdalena River Basin. With that, gracias and thank you for joining our session. Great, so um, thank you everyone for, for watching our presentation about the case study in Colombia. Um, again, just a reminder, we have a Q&A session coming up after our case study presentation. And now we'll continue with the water narratives from Thailand. Hello, good morning everyone. I'm Uttam Gimire, Research Associate and Water Resources Modeler from Stockholm Environment Institute Asia Center. Today, I am going to present a story of Songkram River Basin from Mekong. As you may be aware that Mekong River has multiple water infrastructures in its tributaries and mainstream. However, Songkram remains one of the freely flowing tributaries. As Songkram remains one of the places in Thailand with relatively low human achievement index, the pitfalls in water resources management will impact the locals who rely heavily on water and its resources. To understand how the water mediated resources, ecosystem, and locals are overlooked in the current management of water in Songkram, I am going to present a narrative today. Songkram is in the northeastern part of Thailand and it drains to the central Mekong. Its total area of approximately 13,000 square kilometers can be divided into Upper Songkram and Lower Songkram. The Lower Songkram also boasts the 15th Ramsar site of Thailand in its wetlands. A key characteristic of the river basin is the seasonal reversal of flows from Mekong. It creates a shallow lake of 800 to 1000 square kilometer in the lower part of the Songkram. Almost 85% 
of the Songkram River Basin in its lower part can be classified as the wetlands. Also, as can be seen from here, majority of the area is agriculture and prominently rain-fed. So, how does the flow originate in Songkram? Like any other river basin, the flows originate from the Songkram's upstream areas with relatively low rainfall and then travel downstream to, the, to meet the high rainfall areas. The monsoonal characteristic of the rainfall makes the flow highly seasonal, delivering 90% of the total flows during the wet season itself. While this upstream to downstream flows is not unique, the seasonal reversal of flows from Mekong definitely is. So figures in the right side of this slide show the confluence of the Mekong and Songkram and the subsequent formation of the lake and wetlands in the month of May to July. Now, let's talk about the teleconnection of water in the form of rice export. As we all know, the global average of water footprint of rice is around 2500 liters per kilogram, whereas Thailand exceeds 3500 liters. As majority of the Songkram is agriculturally dominant with rice production, the water footprint of rice is also quite high in the basin. If we look at the statistics of Office of Agricultural Economics Thailand, Songkram on average produces a million tons of rice each year whereas northeastern Thailand and Thailand produces 13 and 33 million tons. Thailand also exports 10 million tons of rice each year to the international markets. If we simply extrapolate the production potential of Songkram to the country level, the production exceeds 38 million tons, which shows that Songkram has high potential for rice production. Apart from that, Songkram is also known for Thai jasmine rice, which is prized in international markets for its high quality. While majority of the water from Songkram leaves its boundary in the form of rice, it is virtually unseen in the overall management of the water. The wetlands and shallow lake in Songkram are also used for agriculture as their water levels start receding. However, their generation is largely dependent on the flows in mainstream Mekong. If the upstream Mekong upstream reservoirs in the mainstream Mekong decide to regulate the wet seasonal flows, it reduces the water level in this confluence of Songkram and Mekong. If the required flood pulse is absent at this confluence, it does not create sufficient backwater flows and inundation, thereby disturbing the formation of the shallow lakes. For reference, it is estimated that for 50 year return period flood in Mekong, Inundation in Songkram exceeds well over 2000 square kilometer. Now, let's talk about the ecosystem and its consideration in the current planning process in Songkram River Basin. The wetlands in lower Songkram are pivotal to the sustenance of locals and survival and existence of wide biodiversity. They receive flows, sediments and nutrients from the upstream and they exchange the locally migrating aquatic organisms like fishes. Similarly, the wetlands provide flow, sediments, nutrients and aquatic species to Mekong and receive the same from it. It also provides several ecological services like provisioning of food, fresh water, cultural beliefs and many more. We can see two species of fishes Pangaceous and mud carp, which are common in Songkram River Basin and constitute a supply of protein to the locals. Songkram hosts more than 200 different plants and fungi, 124 species of fishes, turtles, and a wide biodiversity, which are the direct ecological services pertaining to the water and the wetlands. The locals also believe in the spirits residing in water, for example, Naga, which is supposed to guard their cities. While there are several ecosystem services from the water and wetlands in Songkram, their consideration is still at the end of the planning process. For example, the concept of environment impact assessment holds currently more incentive for a project than consideration of environmental flows in the initial stages of water resources planning.
Now, let's talk about the stakeholder participation in water resources planning within Songkram River Basin. It could be seen that there is a conflict of interest among different stakeholders across both space and time. Government agencies aim to develop water infrastructures which lead to economic prosperity of the region. Civil societies aim to conserve the environment and ecosystem while locals are interested in sustenance through agriculture and fish captures. Similarly, the involvement of stakeholders for water management planning process is also at different capacities. For example, the central government body includes the local government in the planning process, consults the civil society and informs the local farmers on the updates. Any planning, allocation and usage of water within on the central government who are well outside the typical river basin boundary. Similarly, the influence of one stakeholder over another is also quite evident. For example, water resources development project from Royal Irrigation Department is likely to have significant budget and influence over conservation and restoration project from Natural Resources and Environment Office. The contest for water also happens across different times. For example, government plans which are made for five to 10 years decide the allocation and management of water, whereas availability of water for certain months mean agriculture and farming potential for locals. There are also long-term strategic plans from Ministry of Natural Resources and Environment, province offices and the Rural Irrigation Department, and medium and short-term plans from the latter two as well. While these plans discuss about the plans to develop the develop and manage water inside their jurisdiction, they do not explicitly account the transfer of water beyond its boundary and ecosystem in the initial stages of the planning. With this, we could see that the water and its mediated resources like rice and its management well transpires across its physical boundary in Songkram River Basin, but they are not accounted in current level of planning. Similarly, there is a need of considering ecosystem from the initial stages of planning and inclusive participation of different stakeholders. Finally, I would like to wrap my narrative here with this photo, which was taken in another river basin of Thailand, but shows similar issue. How should we manage the water resources such that water mediated resources, ecosystem and the locals become sustainable? Great, thank you everyone. Uh, we hope that you have uh, learned and enjoyed these um, storytelling sessions from our case studies in Colombia and Thailand. Um, finally, um, this is the moment that we want to hear from you. Um, here in the chat, we have um, identified some questions uh, related to our presentations. Uh, please uh, keep them coming. So we're going to start with a very interesting and intriguing question. Thank you, uh, Cindy, for, for asking it. So basically, Cindy um, is asking about what we would recommend to increase women participation, uh, especially in, in projects uh, working with uh, ex guerrilla members um, in the WASH sector. Um, and what to do if um, women, um, although if only me, women are in the meetings, they won't go against the opinion of whom they consider superiors in command level. Yes, um, uh, this is a, a tough question. Basically what, uh, what we are seeing in, in our participation pillar, for instance, we are also connecting with in, increasing participation um, an inclusive participation. And we have a special program um, dedicated to gender and uh, equity issues. And we're, we're looking at it, uh, for instance, in the Campo Alegre basin. But I'll leave that to, to my colleagues, uh, Tanya and maybe Marisa, if you'd like to comment um, a bit more. And on Leonie the too. Leonie. Oh, Leonie, perfect. perfect. I think she's great too. Yes, perfect. Leonie, uh, go ahead. Thank you. I'm just um, jumping on here, but I'd like to say it's a great question. I would actually like to 
um, reframe this as some of the work that we've seen. It's not about engagement of women. It's about power struggles and tensions. So when we're talking about how women's voice is not heard, firstly, they're not engaged. And I agree that that's a starting point. But we actually have to have negotiation processes within our decision making structures that look at and involve our marginalized voices such as women. So for example, I just read your question, Cindy, and it is great. How do women get their voices heard? Well, I think asking that right at the end when there's clearly a hierarchical power structure already in place means that you're just working within that power structure, which is perfectly fine. And you would always expect that those voices are not heard. So you would have to, from the beginning, set up an alternate negotiation process in which alternate voices and power was able to be involved and had some sort of recourse or some structure in which they could actually get traction within the decision making if that's what you wanted at the end. Um, so it's, yeah, I'm just thinking it's more about the design from the beginning, as well as uh, how do we ask them and how do they get involved? I hope that addresses some of the question. Thank you so much, Leonie. Uh, for context, Leonie is also from, from SCI and she's joining us from SCI Asia. Thank you so much for joining us at such an early time. Um, we really appreciate it. So I don't know if uh, Tanya and Marisa, if you have any additional comments on, on that. Yes, perhaps to add that we are working in an initiative uh, related with the, with, the, with the idea to understand how the marginalization groups are uh, working there in this river basin, in Campale River Basin, how the women have some participation or, or act and, and start to participate in different process that we have there. Uh, and understanding the party today, these narratives in the in in this area. So the idea is, uh, as Lenny mentioned before, uh, understand and and uh, prioritize and start uh, thinking in these kind of things uh, be, uh, uh, at the start point of the different projects. So we are in this process now. There. And Claudia, Maris. I can add something else. Also, I mean, I'm, I'm glad that Yanni and Tanya, respectively, in these two case studies are, are considering this, but of course, this is a problem that happens everywhere, right? So we need to think broadly and how these mechanisms and, and um, ways of managing these power structures and struggles um, can be replicated. One way to do it is to always bring in more women, even in the project implementation side, because once women on site, see women being part of the leadership team already have a direct and more um, connection to, to the project team. And then we have more access to, to support those struggles. So I think that's, that's key as well. And I shared one resource uh, from uh, other colleagues that have thought about this as well. So I hope that's useful, Cindy, and for others as well. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Um, so we have time just for uh, one more question. And I'm, I'm seeing here, uh, Sandra asked us if we're working with uh, Carter. And just for, for context for, for everyone, this is uh, in the Environmental Authority uh, located in the Department of Saralda. So, Tanya, if you would like to take on that. Yes. Uh, yes, we are working with the environmental agency, not only with CARDET, uh, also with Corpo Caldas, that are the other environmental agency in charge of this part of the, in this part of the, of the river basin. Uh, we are uh, working related with the formulation process of the PONCA uh, currently, so the working is together with these two environmental agencies. Great, thank you, Tanya. Um, and now, um, thank you again for, for your questions. If you have any additional questions, feel free to send them uh, and write your email address. We can always um, write back. Now we are heading to our interactive session. The idea is to further explore what we have studied in, in each of the cases in Colombia and Thailand, particularly the three components, teleconnections, participation, ecosystems, and will be divided in breakout rooms. We'll have um, four breakout rooms. Uh, Doug, correct me if that's, so. yeah, okay. So we'll have four breakout rooms. 
And you have the opportunity to work through some questions and understand what would be, what are beyond boundaries in your own case, in your own context. So with that, we have, um, again, uh, Doug, can you remind me the assigned time for each breakout room? Yeah, I think we'll, we'll stay in the breakout rooms um, until about 54 minutes uh, past the hour. I'll, I'll put up a, a timer so you'll have 60 minutes to come back to the main room. Perfect. Okay, so now we'll be directed to, to our breakout groups and each moderator will guide us through the activities. Yep, and I'll, I'll put out the, the breakout rooms in just a second here. Perfect. Hi. Hello. Hello. Hi. I hope it went well. New groups. We had a very nice group too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess that the people is already in the rooms, yes. Yes. So I, I think everyone's back. Yes. So Marisa, go ahead and give your uh, concluding remarks when you're ready. Um, don't we have like 30 seconds per group to get like high level, just? Yeah. <laughs> okay, give me just the high level, 30 seconds, not, not even a minute, Camilo, Claudia and Doug. Okay, I'll give my 30 seconds. Um, Basically, we had uh, examples, two examples from Colombia and one example from Australia. And it was super interesting connection, not only with the activities, but the functions, the ecosystem functions um, that we have, for instance, in a creek that now is underneath the concrete or connections between water use um, for agriculture production, such as coffee and palm oil. So it was super interesting. Thank you for- Excellent. I hope you recorded that, that whiteboard. Yes. Right? Okay. I, I have it recorded. Mm -hmm. Camilo? I didn't record it because the room collapses when I was trying to do it. But uh, in our case, we have five different case studies, two in Colombia, uh, one was in London, another one was in Tijuana, Mexico, and the one from Jack in the United States, in Boston. And it was very interesting that in all of them, there, uh, in most of them, in four of them, actually, and there was a problem with uh, also the water quality, with the pollution, with the heavy metals. So we can see in this case that this is something that is happening worldwide. And in this case, maybe the processes could be the same as they are maybe from big cities, like okay. happening in Bogota, in Boston, in Tijuana. And also very important is that the participation is increasing. Also the okay. participation, participation from the stakeholders, wow. and also the dialogues. So this can be the most remarkable aspects that Lovely. I can share with you from, from my book. Okay, uh, very good. And Doc? Yes, yeah, so we had watersheds in um, Hawaii, uh, Washington State, um, Colombia, and Brazil. And some, some aspects of markets, um, you know, the coffee producers in Columbia versus the consumers in Washington state. And then some issues that also could kind of be solved by the same solution, like uh, salmon runs in Washington state and um, native uh, water supply for native Hawaiians is kind of both ties to indigenous water rights. And then okay. similar problems too of uh, runoff, um, untreated runoff into rivers in Brazil and Colombia. Okay, thank you everyone. So let me just bring a couple of thoughts just so you leave this room with something in your head to continue to think about. You can see in the breakout groups uh, how these water places are different and yet they are similar. There are similar concerns everywhere. Those connections happen at two levels because there are common themes to all these water stories but also because watersheds are connected through climate trade and aid. We are not alone, we are not isolated. This is global water that we're talking about here. Uh, with this initiative, we want to bring awareness to these interconnections so we don't keep seeing water as an isolated issue and the problem of those that live in places that are affected by too much or too little water. And with this awareness, we are, ex we are exploring the use of the appropriate tools and science to quantify those connections. 
And so we understand the impact of climate aid and trade on water balances and on freshwater habitats. And in this digital era, we are convinced that the possibilities for innovation in virtual participation and cooperation so we can connect actors to impact, that impact our local water and, and that are beyond our water or our water places. We hope to continue to think about these issues and that you continue to follow us and engaging with us through our Water Beyond Boundaries as we advance this initiative to create a global water community through science and digital engagement. So we hope to continue seeing you and please contact us if you have more interest and um, questions about these issues. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. It was great to have you here today. Thank Bye you. and have a great day, Thank evening, you. wherever Thank you. you are. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Good night. Thank you.